Friends, I'm joining you here from the geographic center of Chicago's Little Italy. But are we really in the only Little Italy? Some people say South Oakley, the heart of Italy. Some people might say Grand Avenue. The real answer is there are a lot of Italian American neighborhoods throughout the city of Chicago and the suburbs. And the question is, how might we define it? Little Italy I'm in currently might be defined by Dan Ryan to our east, Congress Expressway on the north, Ashland Avenue on the west, maybe Roosevelt Road on the south. If we asked people, we'd probably get 20 different answers. And that might just be from the same person. So I guess the conversation is, how do we even define this neighborhood? Is it the restaurants? Is it the people? Is it the street life? Is it the schools? And of course, the answer is it's really a little bit of all of those things. Might be a Mario's Italian Lemonade. Might be the University of Illinois at Chicago. It might be Hull House. And if you come with us today, we're going to talk about a few of those things and a couple surprises. In the 21st century, New arrivals to the city of Chicago have a raft of resources upon which they can draw for support, solace, and material aid. In the middle of the 19th century, this was not necessarily the case. There were the beginnings of mutual aid societies, neighbors helped neighbors, but there were a lot fewer things that people could rely on in their daily life. I'm standing in front of a great example of what can happen when an old building can be repurposed to create a sense of community and belonging and empowerment for new arrivals. This is the Hull House, built by Charles Hull and his family to create their own homestead within the city of Chicago. Three and a half decades after it was built, Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr started the Hull House movement here in 1889. Over the next two decades, they would create a complex that would include over a dozen buildings and it would include resources for immigrants, including a post office, a theater, a gymnasium, and other facilities. Over time, thousands of immigrants would use the varieties of services that they provided here to learn the domestic arts, theatrical pursuits, musical instrument instruction, and a range of other activities. And a number of nearby residents who became very well known are alumni of the Hull House programs, including famous jazz clarinetist Benny Goodman, who grew up several miles away from here. Over time, there's an expansion of other programs, and eventually the Hull House Association had programs all over the cities as part of the Settlement House movement. Currently, the building is used by the Jane Addams Hull House Museum, which is part of the University of Illinois at Chicago. Today, you can stop by the Jane Addams Hull House Museum to learn about the immigrant experience in Chicago and beyond. You can take a look at some of their dioramas, stop by for one of their programs, and also see what they're up to online with a variety of events and programs. Next, we're going to head on over to another part of the University of Illinois Chicago campus to talk about urban renewal and the transformative effect it had on Little Italy. I'm standing here in front of the Richard J. Daly Library here at the University of Illinois Chicago campus. You might not think of Mayor Daley as the most bookish fellow in the world, but his role in creating this campus was nothing short of transformative. By the late 1950s, the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois were interested in creating a full-time, four-year public university in the city of Chicago. Now, the previous home of the University of Illinois at Chicago had been at Navy Pier, where it acquired the nickname Harvard on the Rocks. The idea about creating a new campus in the city was the hope that it would allow students to have the opportunity to have a four-year public school without leaving to another part of the state. A number of sites had been proposed, including the rail yard south of the Loop, a location in the western suburbs, and an area near Garfield Park. What became known as the Harrison Halstead site was 105 acres close to the Loop. There was a lot of interest in creating a campus close to the loop for a variety of reasons. 
When the site was announced formally in the early 1960s, there was a lot of community uproar among Little Italy activists and local residents. A lot of this resistance was headed by the late Florence Scala, who petitioned Mayor Daly at City Hall, along with neighborhood activists, to reconsider this site. The idea behind their logic was that this site would also displace thousands of local residents, many of whom were immigrants or the sons and daughters of immigrants. In 1963, the battle was over and the site was selected. The Harrison Halstead site would be the next home of the University of Illinois at Chicago. Over this time period, over 5,000 persons were displaced, 800 homes were demolished, and 200 businesses had to make way for the creation of this campus. It remains a spot of contention for older residents in the community. It remains a lesson that when large-scale urban renewal projects are created, that one should stay mindful of who is in the way. Next, we're gonna walk on over to Blue Island Avenue, or what I should say is the former home of Blue Island Avenue on the UIC campus. I'm standing here on the campus of the University of Illinois Chicago, the brainchild of architect Walter Netsch Jr. On my right, the Behavioral Sciences Building. On my left, the University Tower. This 105-acre site was part of the original plan for this massive, sprawling campus. It also displaced thousands of residents, many of whom were first or second generation immigrants living here in the near west side. The conversation then was about what would this campus be like and who would it serve. Fast forward 50 plus years and you will find thousands of those children of those immigrants, second, third, fourth generation who do attend school here. So in that respect, it's been a tremendous success. And of course, there are a lot of transformations that happened to make this campus possible. One of them was the removal of large streets. We're standing close to what used to be Blue Island Avenue, which runs from Little Village all the way up to Halstead. Or I should say, it used to run all the way to Halstead. One of the parts of this plan included removing Blue Island Avenue and taking it out so you could create a comprehensive and complete campus plan. Next, we're gonna make our way over to the Shrine of Our Lady of Pompeii. If you think about the lives of late 19th century immigrants in the city of Chicago, no matter where they came from, they had to rely on each other and a spirit of community, goodwill, and self-assistance. The Italians who came to the Near West Side were no different than other groups who came to the city from Germany, Ireland, Greece, and other parts of the world. One of the core aspects of communal life was the church. And certainly for most Italians, it was the Roman Catholic Church. One of the things that was always considered a point of pride was the creation of a parish church. How do we celebrate community? How do we celebrate the Word of God? And also, how do we think about creating a series of activities and resources so that the immigrant community can thrive? I'm standing in front of the Shrine of Our Lady of Pompeii here in Little Italy. When the building was finished in 1924, it was immediately an integral part of the Italian community in this part of the Near West Side. Along with providing religious instruction and regular mass services several times a day, it was also an important place for people to gather, to meet with their neighbors, to learn about what was going on in the community in the same way that others might have gone to a saloon, a grocery store, or a public park. The idea behind this experience was to bring people together in place which is what so many of us like to celebrate in our own time. 80 plus years later, the church remains an integral part of the community. 
and it maintains a relationship since 2004 with a sister church in Pompeii. Friends, next we're gonna walk across the street, talk a little bit about Arrigo Park. When you think of a city's greatest public assets, what do you think of? Its citizens, its parks, its libraries, its recreational facilities. You probably think about a few more right now as we talk about it. Public parks are certainly one of the most egalitarian spaces any city has, Chicago included. I'm standing here in Arrigo Park in the near west side. Arrigo Park started life in 1857 as Vernon Park, the gift of a local real estate investor, Henry Gilpin. Gilpin created a green space, it's an artificial lake, small areas for recreation, and so on. Over time, the park expanded and was later called Vernon Park. The park was renamed Arrigo Park in 1974 after the late Illinois State Representative Victor Arrigo. Today, Arrigo Park has a variety of amenities. People can sit, they can relax and they can wander around away from their homes and residences. Recently, controversy has erupted here in Arrigo Park over the Christopher Columbus statue. You can see behind me that the statue is no longer there. It was removed by the city on July 24th and placed in storage along with the other Columbus statues around the city. This led to a general uproar among community residents and others. Some people claim that Christopher Columbus was an important explorer and should be celebrated for his achievements. Others thought that his time had passed and that he represented an unpleasant and unsavory aspect of our shared history. While the statue remains in storage, others have thought of ways that you might think about starting a conversation about this art. One of the things that I've suggested is if they bring the statue back, they should have a series of rotating public art pieces by Native Americans that respond to Columbus's legacy. And perhaps that's another way to start a different conversation about cultural identity and bring the neighborhood together. Next, we're going to walk over to the National Public Housing Museum and talk about the amazing work they're doing over there. When I first moved to Chicago over 25 years ago, I remember walking down Taylor Street and seeing a series of low-rise brick buildings and wondering, what is that? Who lives there? I was walking by the Jane Addams homes, which were actually built in 1938 as the first public housing project in the city of Chicago. It's appropriate that they're here in the near west side. This area has been for well over 150 years a place for new arrivals. People from distant lands, people from other parts of the United States. So for me the conversation was, why didn't we help out people in this fashion beforehand? A lot of early immigrant groups who had come to the near west side had mutual aid societies. There was self-help. The idea that the federal government would assist people in public housing was a fairly new one, brought about by the ravages of the Great Depression. By the 1990s, there were plans started both by the Chicago Housing Authority under the directives of the federal government to transform public housing throughout the city. Part of these plans called for the demolition of many thousands of public housing units. Jane Addams, which were part of the Abla Homes project, was part of this transformation. Almost every single one of these buildings was torn down. What you see behind me is what will soon be the National Public Housing Museum the last remnant of the Jane Addams homes. The conversations here will include collecting oral histories from former residents, looking at other existing projects, and also to propel housing as a human right. And I hope you'll consider taking a look at what the museum does over the coming months and years. Next, we're gonna walk down Taylor Street to the Chicago Public Library's Little Italy branch. I'm 
I'm standing inside one of the Chicago Public Library's newest branch libraries here in Little Italy, properly titled the Little Italy Branch. There's been some sort of public library facility in the near west side since 1891 when the reading room number five opened in Hull House. In 1924, Chicago Public Library renamed a branch to Roosevelt Branch, and in 2019, this one-story branch library opened here on Taylor Street. It also is part of a rather novel housing partnership that is consonant with the values both of the Chicago Public Library and the Chicago Housing Authority. Within this complex, you also find the Taylor Street Apartments, which include almost 30 Chicago Housing Authority units, along with market rate apartments. The library also provides services to those living in CHA designed to enhance and empower those residents. Next we're going to walk over to Mario's Italian Lemonade where we'll have some Italian Lemonade. One of the things that always distinguishes immigrant communities in most parts of the world is the presence of small-scale vendors. Maybe it's people who walk up and down the street selling small food items, maybe they're selling services, and certainly that is the case for most of Little Italy's history. And if you think about small pleasures growing up in a community like this, you might think of an Italian lemonade. The experience of having a cold shaved ice on a really hot day when you didn't have air conditioning, when you didn't have a refrigerator, when you didn't have ice of your own, would be a pretty amazing, small, but important luxury. Fortunately here on Taylor Street, you have one of Chicago's most celebrated small luxuries in the form of Mario's Italian Lemonade. People line up in front of Mario's Italian Lemonade to have one of their two dozen plus favors, pick up some lupini, and maybe they'll get a candy treat to take home to a friend or relative that they really cherish. If you haven't been here before, it's definitely worth coming out, taking a look, bringing a family, bringing a friend, bringing someone else you care about. As regular watchers of this series know, after a walk down a street, we've experienced the museum together, maybe we've encountered someone along our travels. I'm usually inspired to write a haiku. Today was no different. It really was that special. What's the haiku about? Mario's Italian Lemonade. Oh my, the flavors. Someone cries out, grapefruit? Make mine extra large. <laughs>